Hello, students, and welcome to our lab activity on force. So may the force be with you today as we discuss our lab activity. So while we're getting ready, be sure to open your books so that you are ready to start recording some data as we do our lab together. So to begin, as we open our book to page 41, we can see that the problem of today's lab reads, does the mass of an object affect its rate of fall due to gravity? That is a mouthful, I know. Does the mass of an object affect its rate of fall due to gravity? What in the world does that mean you might be saying to yourself? Well, let me try to illustrate what I mean by that question before we get into the lab. Uh, if we take a quick view over here, we're going to see some of the materials that we're going to need for our lab activity. But I want to begin with two objects that are not a part of your lab, but I'm going to use them to help you understand what the question is asking you. Anybody know what this is? It's a ping pong ball. Anybody know what this is? Oh, it's a bowling ball. Okay, so here I have two balls, ping pong ball and a bowling ball. If I hold this ping pong ball above my head and then let go of it, who can predict what's going to happen to it? Yeah, very good. It's going to fall down, right? It's going to, yeah, it's going to fall down to the ground. It is being pulled by the force of gravity on its puny little mass, and it is being drawn down at a certain rate of speed. It's going a certain number of meters per second down. This kind of sounds like velocity, doesn't it? So it's going to be moving at some rate of speed called its rate of fall ping pong ball is gonna fall. It's gonna fall because of gravity pulling it down. So I think we can understand that, right? Now, what could you say, do you think, I know you're not actually holding them right now, but I'm sure you can imagine holding a ping pong ball in one hand and a bowling ball in the other hand. Now, other than their sizes, their volumes, what could you say in contrast to these two balls? Would you say that the bowling ball is more massive than the ping pong ball? I, I think that would be a, a, an accurate statement. Yeah, ping pong ball, very little mass, all right? Bowling ball, a lot more massive. Now let's do the same thing. If I were to hold this bowling ball above my head, not directly, but a little bit in front, <laughs> and I were to let go, what do you think is going to happen? Please answer quickly because my arms are getting tired. <laughs> yes, it's going to fall. Whoa. Okay, I'm not gonna let it hit the ground because I don't want it to break my toe. But now notice, uh, the difference between these two balls, very little mass, a lot of mass. They're both going to fall. We know that, right? But the question in our lab is asking this. Does their different mass or will their different mass affect how fast they're going to fall? Will one of these fall faster or slower because of its different mass? That is what the question is asking. So let's head back over there and look at it again. Does the mass of an object affect its rate of fall due to gravity? I'd like you to take a moment now 
and you can pause me. Uh, why? I just had to put that bowling ball down. It was getting pretty heavy, I got to say. And, and take a moment and write your hypothesis. Does the mass of an object affect its rate of fall due to gravity? Some examples might be, you know, the more massive the object, the faster it's going to fall. The less massive, the faster it's going to fall. Uh, mass doesn't have any effect on the rate of fall. You can think of different relationships between the mass and the rate of fall of an object. So again, take a moment now and write a hypothesis. Okay, I'm back. Now that you've written your hypothesis, you have some idea of what you are planning to expect during this lab activity, which we'll, again, get to in just a moment. But again, before we do, as I said last week, we're going to be using a lot of graphs to help us as a scientist to interpret what the graph means. And let me just get rid of this here. That's better to interpret graphs in order to visually see our data presented in such a way that will make it easier for us to draw a conclusion as to whether there is a relationship between two or more variables. So I just want to take a couple minutes to explain to you some different potential observations when we collect our data calculate our numbers, and graph our data. Once we look at our graph, what should we expect? Well, first, here's the deal. You are comparing two variables today in the lab. Along the x-axis is going to be the mass. Now, you'll notice on the following page, there is a graph, and you will be setting up that graph with your data. And I'll tell you right now, the objects that we're gonna be using will range in mass from zero grams to 20 grams. So that is going to be the range of our data regarding mass. That's on the x-axis. On the y-axis, woo, yeah, there we go, okay. On the y-axis, we're going to label it the rate of fall. Now, I've already done the lab activity and to help you save some time. Once you crunch all of your numbers, the rates of fall will all be in the range of zero to five meters per second. Meters per second, a range from zero to five on our y axis. So when you get to set up your graph, uh, your range of numbers should be zero to 20. On the x-axis, 0 to 5 on the y-axis, and you are uh, relating mass versus the rate of fall. Now, once you plot your data, as we did last week, you created a line graph. When you create a line graph, there are some basic truths to line graphs when they pertain to science class. Let me show you. I've drawn two lines on this graph right now, a flat horizontal line and a straight up and down vertical line. In both cases, they are straight lines. These straight lines, the horizontal line and the vertical line, I've drawn in red and I've labeled them no. That doesn't mean you can't have a line that looks like that. It just means that is the answer to the question, is there a relationship between these two variables? Is there a relationship between mass and rate of fall if we get a vertical line or a horizontal line? And the answer is no. If you produce a graph that is a horizontal or vertical line, then you can conclude that there is no relationship between the two variables. Now, you can think about that for a minute by looking at the horizontal line. If you look at the horizontal line, as you move from left to right, what happens to the value of mass? Does it increase, decrease, or stay the same? 
it increases as you go from left to right on this horizontal line. So mass is changing. But the question is, if mass changes, will there be a change in the rate of fall? Well, look at this horizontal line again. Is there any change in the rate of fall? Hopefully you answered no, because a flat line indicates that it's the same value every time for the rate of fall. So if you get a line like this, you can say no, there is no relationship between mass and rate of fall. But that's not the only kind of line graph you can have. You can have a diagonal line, either a diagonal line going up or a diagonal line going down. Now you'll notice I've drawn these green just so that you can see them a little bit better and I've labeled them with the word yes. And here's why. If the question is, is there a relationship between mass and rate of fall? Well, if you get a line like these two green lines, you could say, well, yes, there is a relationship between the two. And here's what it would be. If it's this line you're, you're producing, as mass increases, as it goes from left to right with this green line, what is happening to the rate of fall? It is decreasing. It's going from a higher to a lower number. But what if this is the green line you produce? As you go from left to right, the mass is increasing. But what is happening to the rate of fall? As you go from left to right, is it increasing, decreasing, or staying the same? It's increasing. So you could say, if this is the line that you generate, there is, yes, there is a relationship between mass and rate of fall. As mass increases, rate of fall increases. So you're going to be generating a graph during this lab, and you're going to look at the shape of your lines. And looking at the shape of your lines will help you make your conclusion as to whether there is a relationship or there is not a relationship. And then you can state, well, what is that relationship? As one goes up, the other goes up. As one goes down, the other goes up. As one goes up, the other does nothing. You'll have to think about it as you are looking at your graph and how you represent visually the data that you collect. So feel free to watch this part again if you'd like to understand how you should be interpreting your graph when you're done with your number crunching. But now let's go to a close-up view of our lab activity and we're going to gather some data now and then we'll do the lab together. It says, and I'm reading on page 41, does the mass of an object affect its rate of fall due to gravity? You've already written your hypothesis, so we can move on. Step one, obtain the materials. I have them in front of us, and we're going to be using three objects. Object A is a little wooden block with the letter S for science on it, or skirts, either one is cool. So a little wooden block is object A. Object B is a little metal washer, and object C is a metal cylinder. All have three different masses, which we're going to find out in just a moment. And so that's step two, determine the mass of each object in grams. So as I gather the, the masses, I'd like you to write them down. First, I'm going to turn on my digital balance wait for the zeros, and we'll start with object A. So we put object A on the digital balance. I'm getting a quick readout. Object A is two grams. Find in your observation section, it says object A, you can write block next to object A, and uh, where it says mass in grams equals you can write two grams for object A. 
All right, next we've got object B. Again, object B, you can label it the washer. Object B is the washer. And let's take the mass of object B. Oh, that was quick. The mass of object B is five grams. Five grams. So write that down in the appropriate place in your book. Mass in grams equals five grams. And now, object C. Object C is the cylinder. Oops, sorry about that, C. But, oh, C for cylinder. How cool is that? So C for cylinder, label object C, cylinder, as I record the mass. Wow, okay. The mass of object C is 20 grams, 20 grams. So we've got two grams for the block, five grams for the uh, washer, and 20 grams for the cylinder. That data you should have written down right now. And while you're making sure you have those numbers written down, I am just going to rearrange things a little bit here for the next step. Because it says, measure the height, the distance, the object will fall to the floor. Now my height is limited and my camera is even more limited and I'm not gonna climb up on a ladder or the table for this lab. So I'm going to be placing the meter stick on top of the table, which is also one meter off the ground. So I'm going to be dropping objects a distance of two meters. So where it says distance there, uh, observations distance equals write down 2m or two meters. That is the distance we're going to be dropping all of our objects. That's a control. We're not going to change that. They're all going to fall the same distance. With me so far? All right, now I'm gonna have to stand up. So I'm gonna have to change the view here to the lab view so that you can see me a little bit better as I hold these objects. And I'm gonna need a stopwatch as well. Whoops, there we go. Stopwatch, as you know, measures seconds and it measures down to the one hundredth of a second. Now, if you've ever used a stopwatch, there's a great game you can play with stopwatches, the stopwatch game. Now, I have to get the lighting just right here. But if you uh, play the stopwatch game, it's great to see what your reaction time is by hitting the start and the stop button as quickly as you can. Here we go. Boop, boop. All right, that was 0.22 seconds. I know I can do it faster than that. Hold on. Oh, 0.12 seconds. Hold on. I think I can do better than that. Oh, no. Oh, no. 0.12 is my fastest so far. I'm doing this over and over again. Ah, 0.13. Oh, there's 0.12 again. I've seen people get it as, as fast as 0 0.08 seconds. Great game to play for reaction times, but I do it for a reason. Here's the reason. All of us are different. We all have different reaction times. And that reaction time is crucial when we're doing a lab activity dealing with precision. So it is important when we do this lab that it's the same person as the timekeeper every time, because that will account for the change that each of us have as individuals for our uh, reaction rate. So my reaction rate is gonna be a constant, so all of our data will be relative to my you know, reaction rate. But if I were to hand this off to someone else and then they start collecting data, the numbers are going to be all wrong because we're not accounting for that different reaction time. So here's the deal. I'm going to demonstrate for you what I did earlier because it's difficult to, uh, uh, to, to do all three things at once. So I had a helper earlier gather this data and we held the objects two meters above the ground and we reset the stopwatch each time. We started it when it fell, we stopped it when it hit the ground, and then we recorded 
the time, and we did it three times for each of the three objects. We went ready, set, go, and we stopped the time, and we recorded it. We did that for object A. We did it for object B. Ready, set, go. And we did that for object C. Ready, set, go. And we wrote down all of the numbers. So I'm going to share those numbers with you now to save you some time. And once you have these numbers, you'll have all of the info you need to complete the rest of the lab. So let me give you the numbers. Object A. Object A. There were three drop times, and the reason we did that was because there's always some room for error when looking at the start and the stop, a lot of variables here. So oftentimes scientists will repeat things and take averages in order to minimize any negative impact from the variables that we don't want to be variables. So we did it three times, and here are the three drop times for object A. Drop one, and these are all in seconds. Drop one, 0 0.47 seconds. Make sure you're writing it down, 0 0.47 seconds. Drop two, 0 0.53 seconds. 0 0.53 three. Drop three, 0 0.50. 0. 0. 0.50. Now let's go down to object B. I'm just going to write all the data down first, then I'll help you number crunch. Object B was the washer. Drop one. Drop one was 0 0.46. 0 0.46. Drop two, 0 0.5. 0 0.53. And drop 3 was 0 0.51. That's 0 0.51. Now let's go down to object C. Object C, the cylinder, our drop 1 was 0 0.49. 0 0.49. Drop 2 was 0 0.52. 0 0.52. And finally, drop 3 was 0 0.49. 0 0.49. Now we've got all of our data, and let's head back to the close-up view here and uh, gather our thoughts as I gather the objects from the floor. Here we go. So object A again was the wood block. S for science. Object B was the washer. Object C was the cylinder. We've collected all of the data for three drops for each of the three objects. And now this is what you need to do. Using a calculator or using a piece of paper, or using your noggin between your ears, you are going to find the average drop time for each of the three objects. Uh, how about I pause now and let's talk about that. Who can tell us how do you determine the average of three numbers? If you said, you add the three numbers and divide by three, that is exactly what needs to be, okay? So you're gonna add those three numbers and divide by three, and that will equal the average drop time for object A. You're gonna do that for all three objects, but you're not done yet, so hear me out before you start doing all the number crunching for the other objects. Again, we're focusing on object A, the wood block, right now. You've collected your three numbers, the three drop times. You've averaged them together to get an average drop time. But remember what the problem is asking us. 
Does the mass of an object affect its rate of fall due to gravity? Well, you know the mass of the block. We collected that earlier, it's two grams. But what about the rate of fall? That's the last piece of information we need there in our book, the rate of fall for object A, and then subsequently B and C as well. Well, how do you find the rate of fall? Rate of fall is its speed. So tell me, how do you determine the speed of something? It's distance divided by time. So what is the distance each of these objects traveled? It's two meters. That's the distance. What is the time? We're going to use the average drop time to divide it with the distance. So it's going to be two meters divided by the average drop time, and that will equal the rate of fall. Now, once you have calculated all of these numbers, on the next page is the graph that we were talking about earlier. Remember, you're going to label the x-axis mass the y-axis, the rate of fall, as I showed earlier. And so your data, you have to be really careful. You're going to be using the mass of each object. So it might be a good idea to circle those three masses right now, the 2, the 5, and the 20. Circle those masses. And when you calculate the rate of fall for each of the objects, it's that number that will be on the y-axis. So you might want to put a circle around those three lines for rate of fall, just to remind you when you are creating your graph, it's those two numbers which are the coordinates you're going to use on your graph. So let me head back to our notes here really quick for a moment and finish this up. When you're all finished, remember you're going to draw a line graph and you're going to get some type of a line. Remember what those lines will tell you when trying to come to a conclusion. Horizontal or vertical line? No, there is no relationship between mass and rate of fall. Or a diagonal line or a curved line will tell you, yes, there is a relationship and you can expand on what that relationship is. So take some now, some time now, finish your calculations, draw your graph, and hopefully we'll have some time to discuss this graph before the end of the period. But either way, I want you to watch the final video on Google Classroom before you finish up for the day. So be sure to write your conclusion and we'll talk a little bit later. And for now, I'm gonna say bye-bye.